it's one of those uh, te- truths, te- you know? technically banks owe us all money you know but you yeah. can never cash it in so but you'll never like, cash it in you know forget it yeah the only bank that gives me back money is like n26 they have this cash back thing but i'm pretty sure like you know like they, they're getting so much more from me so i'm pretty sure now i'm i'm absolutely sure so what does that what does that mean so basically you spend and they 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 give you like a small micro payment back or is it yeah like- and i don't even know what's the calculation behind it and yeah, honestly, yeah. i don't want to know because it's like one euro two euros three euros it's like okay yeah it's a token but it's at least a signal right it's a positive signal rather than like just grasping your like i'm using nat west right now like the worst bank ever no disrespect to nat west but you really are terrible online um you need like three different passwords none none of which you can set yourself they're like just alphanumeric things horrible to sign horrible. into it and i'm just like what is going on here i stopped checking the bank account because like i can't go through that experience of figuring out these passwords is like absolutely uh, appalling anyway we're live man so we better watch what we say because this is now broadcasting out to everybody um so welcome everybody to brain food live on air it's episode 81 we've got an amazing show for you today i'm super excited because this is actually one of the core topics always close to my heart tech recruiting what has changed what has 2020 done to one of the hardest challenges in recruiting? How do you recruit software engineers? So um, it's going to be a fantastic uh, uh, hour of conversation. We've got some great guests to bring on. Uh, also super excited because once again, we've upgraded Adam Gordon, um, who is uh, who is not in the co-host seat. Um, and we've got Pedro Oliveira in to do the co-hosting. But before we begin in all of that, we have to do a sound check as we usually do. So if you can hear me okay on Crowdcast, can you just please say hello on the chat stream and say, Hong, yes, your audio is fine. Um, we are multi-streaming, I hope. Um, I think we're at LinkedIn. We should be okay. If you're on LinkedIn Live and you follow me there and you can hear me okay, just say hello there very quickly to say you can hear me. Um, and we are live on facebook as well so if you can hear me there also just give me a thumbs up or comment or get on with it home whatever uh, let me know uh you can hear me there as well that would be really good okay that's fantastic thank you we're getting some messages back it seems that everyone can hear me it's great uh quick word for our sponsors by the way sponsors this week are past technology um uh, past technology are an amazing referencing and background checking tool one-stop shop for all of that stuff i don't know whether you know but basically having shifted everything to remote hiring suddenly the requirement to do more due diligence a more professional consistent due diligence on the people you hire is becoming a premium concern so if you haven't used uh uh, an automated or a more sophisticated system to do uh background and referencing checking you should really do that you can't be chasing people up with email and phone call anymore so check out past technology folks they got a 30-day free trial i believe um i'm going to share the link in the chat stream there uh so check it out Okay, let's get on with the show. Um, Pedro Oliveira, great to see you, man. Um, and great to have you back on Brain Food Live. I think the last time you were here, I was actually in Lisbon. Um, I was actually in Lisbon in what was was? That? your event. I forget yes. the name of it. Yes, um, uh, that conference that we organize every exactly. year, except this year, maybe the next one. Let's see. Yeah, fantastic event. And uh, hopefully, cross fingers that you know you, there's a way in which you know, we can bring that back because I thought that was a really useful conference stroke career fair type of combo, which is a really yeah. unique kind of feel, you know. Um, so excellent. Um, Pedro, for the people who don't know you, can you just quickly introduce yourself and you know right. what it is that you do? Uh, so, well, first of all, thanks for, for the invite. Um, I don't have the Scottish accent. I can try, but I don't think you will like it. Um, so I'll just go ahead and introduce myself. I'm one of the founders at Landing.Jobs, which is a tech recruitment marketplace. Uh, we operate in Europe, and uh, you know, talent is from all over the place. And um, I also uh, started recently, you know, within the same group, Future.Work, which is more of a career development uh, platform, community and career development platform. We're still figuring out what it's going to be like. We're testing new tools um, into career development and tech recruitment. So uh, watch out. Uh, MySpace, I guess MySpace is not, not exactly, I used to remember MySpace, damn. It's still um, going on, man. MySpace still is, on. is, is still, still a thing, absolutely. No. Um, no, but, 
Good. Uh, fantastic to see you uh, back here, uh, Pedro. And we'll talk about future work at some point because I think it's very exciting. Right. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll we'll move on from there. So as we start with every sort of week, this is where is the big thing. Like, have you read the newsletter? And if you did, uh, you always say, "Of course, man." D don't be afraid Thanks. to say you haven't. You know, people no, are busy. I did. I did. And I can. I have proof that I did. First of all, I'm one of those even uh, people that retweet every time you you put it on your Twitter. It's but the most basic form of support, but I do it every time. And uh, I read it, and uh, I know you're going to ask me for three of them, uh, three. But I have four. Is oh. that okay? That's totally okay. Um, so four things excited you about the recruiting Brave Food newsletter last week. What were those things? Let's go through them one by one. All right. So um, the first one was uh, because I'm, I'm, you know, that uh, you know when I answered the twenty questions uh, on recruiting Brave Foods, uh, uh, basically uh, one of the things I'm into. I'm still reading the the, the book Shogun, and uh, I'm still drinking Nika. So first thing that uh, struck me was the Japan shirtings. Yeah. And like how, how can a culture of, you know, samurai culture, uh, you know, end up like that? And it's not it's not a critique. It's not. Well, it is kind of. But um, it just was like, you know, crazy, you know. So that that struck me um, to the heart. Um, but uh, it was pretty much that's just this self-realization of how did that culture become this? It's crazy. Um, it's on that note, folks, I've just shared the link on the chat stream there. It's a really interesting article by Bloomberg. Um, and it's a, quite an in-depth one. It's an in-depth case study of the, I think it's pronounced Hikamori phenomenon. Um, and this is the a phenomenon of basically unemployed single Japanese people who are now con you know, considered the lost generation, if you like, um, but they're now hitting the, the mid forties kind of age, yeah. um, and they haven't progressed career wise. They're still at home, uh, living with their parents, supported by their parents, can't find a way back into the job market, um, and living pr pr predominantly on the internet. And I read that. I agree with you. It's a, it's a very interesting, um, Japan's always interesting culturally, isn't it? Um, yeah, it like is. very, very sort of unique and idiosyncratic culture. Um, uh, but at the same time, it's also for me like a little bit of a maybe a window into the future because what the hell are we all doing right now? You know, we're living uh, in front of the internet. Where a lot of us are uh, either uh, unemployed or uh, not fully employed. Maybe in future it will yeah. kind of look a little bit where the Japanese have been. So, really interesting read, and I'd recommend people just digest on that, have a think, and you know, um, uh, uh, I guess. You know, not to depress anybody, but it's like, okay, what do we do about it, and how do we, you know, what can we learn from this phenomenon, and uh, and and perhaps, you know, uh, not 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 go down there if we don't want to do that. Yeah, what uh, struck me the 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 most besides that is also the dimension of the problem, um, and you know, like I'm calling it a problem. Not sure if it's the right the, the right way to to call it, but the dimension is a bit over six hundred k Japanese uh, people living with their parents. Uh, yeah. over 40s. This is crazy, you know. Um, so that was the first one. Um, and then uh, another one, actually, I saw it in the newsletter first, so I'll, I'll, I'll handle that to you. But then it it resurfaced a couple other times, another one on, on Twitter and then on um, the CTO's group that I'm part of, uh, which is the job page grader. You know, ah, yes, cool. It's a very simple tool. Um, you know, have a look. I have nothing else to say. Just uh, it 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 was maybe I would say three things uh, from the newsletter. This is the plus one because it's just nice tool. You know, popped up a couple other times in my um, in my timeline. It was cool. You know, quick quick, quick one on the job page creator guys. Um, this is actually an old tool that um, PH Creative, which is an employer branding company. Um, they refurbished this, um, and I think they've improved it. Um, and essentially what, what it is is that you put your career page into this uh, search field, and they'll just give you a report on it, um, on the SEO, on the usability, on the, the, the use of language. Is it inclusive language, for instance? Um, and it will give you like a technical and also content-style breakdown of your career page. It, and you have to pay for an email. Well, you pay with an email, basically. So you have to put your email in. But it's fairly cheap for what you get back. And uh, it might give you 
at least something to work on if you're thinking about your career page and you're wondering hmm, how do i improve that how do i get better traffic how do i do etc it might be worth you having a go so i've just shared it again on the chat stream on crowdcast there i hope someone can also share that um on linkedin if they can let me see if i can do it there as well i'm gonna try and be a little bit more equitable in my behavior here um okay cool what else uh, uh pedro so the 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 last two they, they are like related it's about remote of course um mm -hmm. and uh you know the the kleiner the 2020 kleiner perkins especially yep. the post covid workplace so it's really nice uh coda they're using coda I, actually when i when i opened it i thought it was notion notion but then it's it's called so it's very similar and um the 20 the 2020 report it's really good and um if you check the post covid workplace and then like work companies are thinking about uh you know going back to the office or not and you know most of them are like clearly aiming at the hybrid uh, model so that means uh, lots of challenges and opportunities ahead uh, for entrepreneurs for for companies and for employees as well you're looking at the number one critic of hybrids by the way um it's, I think tough. It's, a, it's a tough model huh it's a very tough the easiest one is uh office only or remote only dude you know? i think it's a com it's a transitional period where we're kidding ourselves that we can do it yeah um it's like running two operating systems on your computer you can do it um but why <laughs> it's like a but cool. why scenario but uh um, you know it's like having a mac and then you virtualize windows why would you do that you know exactly there's, another laptop there's no reason why you would do it and what would happen i think you'll buy two two laptops with you know windows and, and mac <laughs> but you would end up doing that rather than sticking it into a single machine right. and what will happen i think for business is that we'll end up just having departments that okay you need to be in the office great we'll just pass you out and there'll be a bigger separation um between that and you know the folks or departments that can work remote so i think we're kidding ourselves a little bit to think that we can do this because it's just going to be yeah. massive cultural overhead to do hybrid um anyway um okay um by the way i've just shared the report there two things about the kleiner perkins thing number one i really like to see them back because they lost mary meeker about a year ago mary meeker by the way is, does the internet trends report i think everyone reads that it's like the biggest report on the, uh, it comes out every year she left to set up her own uh, VC. And I think Kleiner Perkins basically lost one of their biggest marketing type of uh, assets by that happening. So it's great to see them go and publish something like this. Um, it is actually on the back of a survey for their from their portfolio. So sample bias there, of course, so check that out. But I also like the implementation. As you mentioned, Pedro, Coder AI, I think it's a really great tool okay. to try and present it. Um, I, it's very similar to Notion as well. Uh, the only thing I thought was a little bit missing from this is that it didn't allow anybody to go on to additionally collaborate on it um, because it might have been like a cool thing if there was a way in which, oh, you know, you could volunteer additional yeah. stuff into it, which Coder AI allows you to do. Uh, I might do something on brain food with this, by the way, because I, I'm very excited about the idea of getting the community to produce and contribute more because they want to do that. And right now it's just filtering bottleneck through me and it makes no sense. So anyway, watch this space. Okay, one more, Pedro, before we get yeah. smarter people onto the show. Um, um, yeah, the last one is, uh, you know, you know, I had to say this one, the, the Chris Hart um, Twitter thread. Yes. Uh, so this guy is a marketing uh, Twitter genius uh, of sorts. And um, he did another one. And, um, you know, obviously, hey, uh, he's selling his own stuff, uh, but who isn't? So it's it's okay. And uh, one of the things that struck me the most, and I'm, I'm pulling this one up because I'm, I'm from Portugal. I'm in Lisbon right now. And uh, he mentioned that in the future, regardless of if it's hybrid or not, there's going to be a lot more remote on site when this this COVID thing is gone. And, um, you know, most popular locations is Portugal, Spain and Puerto Rico or something like that. But, you know, Portugal was forced. So I was happy about that. So I'm highlighting that one. You have got a huge chance, man. I mean, not only Lisbon, I think people will end up so, in general. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that all those little like little towns well, across the Tagus, right? All those little towns that people ignore, um, they're going to start being populated by, I would say, everyone who's a digital worker is going to pile into those places. I love this. I love yeah. this. Also, people are um, getting out of the big city. You know, a lot of a lot of people lived in Lisbon because they had to. 
And I really hope they go away because it's overpopulated. I'm from Lisbon. I would love people to go away. So I have an emptier city, more livable city but like this. That's what they call the barcinalization of cities. So yeah, we're moving yeah. a bit through that. So I think maybe COVID was good in that sense that we can explore the rest of the country as well. Dude, COVID is a huge leveler. It basically squashes metropolitan centers, in my opinion, right. and it will spread hopefully economic wealth um, around, which is what we've been wanting to do. You know, a big part of the reason why we have the, the Brexits of this world and the Trumps of this world is because yes. regions are um, kind of struggling against the cities. Um, and COVID-19, in a very strange way, forces the distribution of jobs to different places. Um, so hopefully this will work. I think countries that have simply nice climate are going to be massively in the benefit here um uh, simply because you know if you're going to work remote and it's going to be you're going to lose the big city why would you not go to a nicer place we've got yeah. katie Pichard here she might be joining us later um and she's in malaga right i mean why not uh, <laughs> you know it's like um good choices there's another thing that i need to talk about very quickly is the threat and again i'm not sure whether threat is the right word either um, but ultimately, the leveling is not just going to be national, it'll be global. Um, and there's going to be, I think, a government reaction against this. Um, mm -hmm. And there's going to be a big tension between what maybe the people want and what the companies want versus what the governments want. Um, meaning, um, countries are going to say, hey, you can't relocate that job because uh, we need that job here in this country. Um, and then suddenly, the um so in other words remote working the natural logical next step to remote work is to offshore the job um uh, because you might end up working with somebody who is equally good um but costing far less why not you know as a business that makes mm -hmm. sense to do that yeah but um, governments are gonna step in for sure they're totally gonna step it, it in. it already happened in another situation i can i can share this uh it's it's public but um you know kind of like portugal and um finland are kind of like cut ties in a way because uh, we we like the portuguese government as a strategy of like attracting um let's say retired people to you know bring in your all your savings and spend it here right mm -hmm. um so it works really well like with france netherlands and stuff with finland it started like happening more and more to the point where they cut ties but like it wasn't really re relevant for reports. So it's just a situation where the government steps in because they Super want to get Finnish people to spend the money in Finland and not in Portugal. I mean, you saved all your savings and now you're getting all the money from the social security coming to Portugal and spending it here. So it doesn't, the, the system is um, corrupted somehow, you know? So it's just an example, uh, a very micro example, but definitely it's gonna happen. And when that social security money is not coming in, Oh man, the state is stepping up. Yeah, it's going to be very interesting, folks, and it's going to be a big challenge on what we want the uh, our human future to be. Because one of the like we complain about immigration, but the reason why people come to rich countries is because we're accumulating the wealth, we're agglomerating the wealth in the same way a big city agglomerates the wealth to to the regions. Oh, sure, um, people go go to there. Um, now, if we don't want the immigration, then we might need to tolerate the job flight, um, because if we push that out, then people won't come. Um, but then, of course, the country um, will have to get used to a different standard of living. So we've got two major trends that are going to be in tension, um, and I'd be interested to see what people think about that. These are deep topics, probably deeper than a Brain Food Live, uh, going to need bigger brains and what pedro and i can muster uh to, to solve this problem sure. uh, we we only know about tech recruiting man so let's talk about this um okay before we bring on uh, ala and manjuri and maybe katie as well um let's talk about tech recruiting from a before and after scenario so the setup of this show is going to be tech recruiting before covid was hard man uh, this is the reason why landing jobs exist, why we work mm -hmm. was set up. It was like, how do we solve this? No one enjoys hiring software engineers. Now, has it got easier? Um, because let's say everyone is now remote. Surely that means suddenly, whoa, global talent market, it is easier to recruit software engineers. Um, and yet I look on the poll that people have been filling in and like 100% of people saying, no, it's got harder. So it's a very interesting phenomena there. Actually, one person said it's easier. Um, so it's quite an interesting phenomena. And I want to just ask you a quick overview, Pedro, um, what your thoughts are currently, like the big changes that COVID-19 has wrought on tech recruiting particularly. 
So I think like when, when you think about the, the let's say, uh, t uh, talent recruitment uh, funnel, you know, before the funnel, let's talk about strategy, all right? So, and I think the, the talent strategy became uh, a lot harder. First of all, because we are living in this period and we don't know what's coming next, okay? So then when you see all those news, like Google is going remote and stuff like that, what they're saying is, for the moment, they are, but they, they, they still don't know exactly how it's going to be like post-COVID, right? So I think this is the, the, the biggest uh, challenge, is like understanding how to position yourself, what's your strategy for uh, talent, talent uh, tech recruitment you know, in general. You know, in terms of the funnel itself, now let's talk about the traction all the way to the, um, the, the, the let's say, post hire validations that you mentioned at the beginning, um, which was one of the things. So I think some things became easier, some other things, not really. So let, let's put it like this, a, a big blocker uh, before was like bringing someone into the office, logistics uh, with, with developers, yeah. with, with tech. tech. That's gone. You know, you need to do it online with the tech assessments, tech interviews. I've hired remote uh, people entirely uh, that I've not seen before, and it's fine. You know, it's okay. So, I think that part became a bit easier. the 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 um, The beginning of the funnel, the attraction, it really depends on your strategy. All right, it may have become easier or harder. So, it, if you're not going remote, especially with developers. The more remote you are, the easier it will be to attract. That, that's the simple rule, you know. And we see this in our platform. Uh, the more the remote job is, the easier it will be to attract. The, that in itself is the fundamental truth. I mean, uh, the, the research. I mean, this is going back years. Developers have for a long time wanted flexibility of location, um, and companies will always default to full time permanent on site. Um, and I think a lot of the reasons why companies have struggled is because of the location issue. You've got to pull this person to the to, to, to this location yeah. if you can't compete on salary with the big boys. So um, that goes away, hopefully, with remote. But it also means that you need to be able to do remote properly. I, I think it's hard to compete if you're mm -hmm. in a sort of a, a second tier city and you don't offer remote, then I think you're going to spend a long time looking for that software developer, you know? um yep. it's going to be really tough okay one more thing that you thought was an interesting phenomena that's changed in tech recruiting before being manjuri katie and Al on so uh, and again our conversation is going to be more about post covid but obviously we cannot uh, overlook the the moment we're living so what we felt uh, in our marketplace was uh, there was uh, especially in april and may there was a big bump bump of um uh, new people looking for jobs, so active, active uh, talent. Um, but um, after that, it's kind of like uh, went down. So the turnover in companies is is low is lower than it used to be. Um, we got some feedback from clients that this is happening. So it's good for the companies in a way, even though like you need some sort of healthy turnover. But at the, at the same time, it's like the, the market is a bit more stagnated. That's that's the way that, that we feel. So it's harder for the attraction part. So if developers wanted uh, remote jobs or more remote jobs, I'm, I'm using the, the expression more remote jobs because sometimes they don't want the full remote. They just want the, the, the um, like four days a week or, or uh, one day a month going to the office, some sort of thing. And, um, you know, it definitely... Um, comes into play now uh, with the, the, the COVID. Uh, to attract is a lot harder right now. And after post-COVID, I mean, especially this sort of like uh, professions, uh, engineering, let's put it just the engineering, and I'm separating engineering from, let's say, product engineering. My advice for companies is like, go full remote or almost full remote. Uh, for product, I mean, you can have like, uh, I know you don't believe in hybrid, but the more hybrid-ish approach uh, to it. But it's it's a big mess. So I think like right now people are struggling with the strategy. That's the core thing, and it's a big mess. You know what? Let's bring some people on that might be able to talk to us about strategy. Um, so I'm going to bring these ladies on together. Actually, why not? Let's get five people on screen at the same That's time. Great. Can can Brain Food Life handle it? I don't know. Um, let's bring on. Manjuri Sina, um, and I see Ala Pablo over there as well. Let's bring her on also. 
Uh, let's see if that can happen. And I believe Katie's there as well. So you know what? Let's see if I can bring Katie on as well. Boom. Might as well bring everyone, you know. It's one you know what? That was nine, that was that was the original eight. purpose of Brain Food Live was to literally bring people out of the crowd and say, "Yeah, let's come and talk." Um, which actually I might do back again for Christmas because Brain Food Live is happening on Christmas Day, and we're going to do a long show there, and it might just be like right. a free for all, you know. Um, Hello. Okay. Hey, everybody. How are you doing? Um, so let's. Um, Let's uh, let's do some introductions first. So Manjuri, great to see you. And for the people who don't know you, can you quickly introduce yourself? Who you are? What do you do? Well, I'm 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 Manjuri. I hope you can hear me. Just give me a thumbs up if you can. Uh, hey, thanks. Hi, hi, Katie. Um, and I'm a panda lover to begin with. And I uh, I, I heard Pedro and Hong talking about landing festival. So a lot a lot of sagresh and a lot of super bok and uh, and the big panda is what i always uh, remember from landing festival I miss those uh, hope we can get back to those yeah um yeah so um i i, I had uh, tech talent acquisition for olx group uh, we are across 30 countries in the in the world and just to summarize tech hiring has not become easy and Pedro is actually helping us with with tech hiring for for Lisbon, and it's a challenge. But I'll talk about more later. Yeah, that's I mean, very interesting to get this international view as well. Um, Ala, really good to see you. Um, welcome to the show, your Brain Food Life debut. Um, quickly, for the people who don't know you, can you introduce yourself? Like who who you are and what do you do? Yes, thank you so much. I hope you also guys can hear me. This is one of the first things you say, eh? You're muted or you can hear me. Yes, uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. And uh, yeah, my name is Ala. I'm a technical recruiter at Miro. And I also uh, build in tech communities uh, for the Slack. And I will be happy to tell you a little bit more about uh, new challenges that I face and some great stuff that I learned from the community sourcing and uh, recruiting. Fantastic. Great to see you there, pa uh, Allah. Um, and Katie, great to see you. Um, um, uh, quickly again, who, who you are and what it is you do, Katie? Hey, thanks for the invite and uh, spontaneous jump on the show. Really, really happy to be here. Um, um, Katie, uh, Katie is also fine. Uh, <laughs> I'm uh, currently based in Malaga from where I'm heading the talent acquisition team um, for the workshop. Uh, we are based actually in two locations uh, in London where the, everything is happening or not anymore. Uh, and Malaga, which is, uh, you know, the sunniest capital of Europe, I think. Uh, <laughs> and pri prior to that, I spent some time in Berlin um, working for SoundCloud, Native Instruments and Google. And even prior to that, in another uh, top tier city, Barcelona, um, where I was working for various clients. So been in uh, recruiting for 10 years and well, here I am reinventing everything from, from the scratch. That's amazing. You know what, what I really like about this, we've kind of got a European kind of vibe going on. I mean, the timing of this prevents a sort of the US folks from joining us, but um, hopefully this will give us at least a good snapshot as to what is going on with tech hiring in the European context. Um, Manjuri, let's go to you first. I mean, you mentioned straight away that you don't think it's actually getting easier um, even though, you know, on some level of intuition, you might think it, it is because of this, you know, a, a movement to remote. Um, but how would you uh, explain, like, what's your explanation as to why it's become more difficult to hire software engineers? Hey, thanks, uh, Hong. And uh, I think uh, Pedro kind of uh, outlined it very well. Um, I would add to that saying that we, we complicated matters ourselves. So during the, and, and this is also a learning from an exercise, uh, no one knew, you know, something like COVID would happen and the impact would be like this, of course. Um, so most organizations um, put a hold on hiring. And if you stop the momentum on tech hiring, that is one of, uh, one of the biggest hierarchies that you can, you can do in, 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 in the hiring history. Um, and that's, that's one of something that we are facing. So very recently, I've also seen this impact on LinkedIn. Um, you have a lot of uh, companies now wanting to quickly hire tech recruiters. I see that in the Berlin market. I've been seeing this in, in the Lisbon market as well. So at that, at, uh, between April to June, we saw companies really put a hold on hiring and advertising, which is fair. Of course, you want to protect your employees and your contracts and so on and so forth. 
but putting a stop to tech hiring that is that is and especially engineers have uh, really pushed um uh, pushed the momentum into the funnel backward the second bit is is oh, also, hang on Manchu, yeah. let, me, let me stop you there that's yeah. a really interesting bit of insight which i hadn't considered actually um that there is actually a momentum involved in recruiting it's almost like a, a river of, of of talent um but if you stop the flow it actually becomes really difficult to restart it um particularly if one of the ways in which you dealt with uh lockdown and the early stages of this pandemic is to get rid of your recruiters for instance you know yeah. you suddenly have to retool so you've you've lost your capability to do the recruiting so that's a really interesting bit of insight in terms of uh in terms of why tech recruiting now is harder. Okay, so I like that one. You were about to say something else, uh, Manju. So I'll let you finish that before we move on to uh, some of the other guys in, in the uh, in, on the show. Yeah, um, the, the second bit was on, on this whole uh, dilemma of should we go remote, should we not go remote, should we do hybrid, should we do uh, uh, flexible but two days, three days, and what kind of mode we are in. Uh, just to take an example of my own organization, since we work in different countries and across the world, we've seen COVID in waves. So Europe happened, then we saw the impact on India, we're seeing the impact on LATAM, now we are seeing the impact on, on Europe once again. So this, this conundrum continues. I take an example, Codility did a, did a survey recently and they presented it um, uh, to us because they're partners uh, for, for our assessment. Um, and they presented that 76% of engineers said that they, were, they are happier in a remote setup. And this, this ideally, um, and 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 64% of them said that they're less likely to leave. So there are two things that come out of this. Number one, we definitely have to consider going remote. We need to figure out how to do that. Number two would be on uh, on the fact that this will become a competitive edge for organizations to to actually go remote. And I, I won't uh, hog the limelight. I'll talk about it a little later of how we are strategizing this and maybe also how Pedro is helping us with uh, with this. But no, I'll, I'll be happy to talk about how we um, spoke to our stakeholders, how we presented data points to our stakeholders and actually now have started hiring remotely in Portugal as well as of as of this week. Um, yeah. So there's maybe more more later on that. Super interesting. I just want to tease out a second really interesting point you mentioned, Manjuri, which was that the expectation from the, the engineering community is now that remote is, is mandatory. It's almost like, yeah. of course, it's remote. Um, and because they are remote, um, there's less interest in moving um quote unquote even moving is probably the wrong term to use now isn't it um like all of it is about like physical the physical proximity of it but let's say you have got configured your home setup to such a point where you're quite relaxed or you've sorted it out you know let's not forget that engineers are quite highly paid um they're not precarious workers the people that have uh, over the past 10 15 years or so uh, managed to achieve a reasonable material return uh, for their skills They've got a nice setup. They've got a, everything uh, sort of sorted out at home. They can deliver their work. Maybe they're switched off in terms of their their job demands now. They don't have to necessarily. It's not as high a priority for them. Super interesting. Okay, let's um, let's have a, a, a ask the same question to you, uh, Allah. I mean, you're working for and you've got you're working for Miro, which is a, the mind mapping tool, isn't it? Um, a really cool app um uh, so yeah everyone loves it i don't actually i have to say um but that, that's because i'm incompetent at mind mapping uh, um I, I, literally i don't like it um but i, I think it's <laughs> I, I, have no key, I have no keyboard skills so i have a hardware interface problem uh so it's not not on the product at all um tell me about what you found when it's come to uh sort of recruiting software engineers particularly before and after like the pandemic is there been like a big shift in your view and if so what have you seen yeah, thank you so much. I believe that's uh, also same experience. Some things became easier, some things became harder. Um, what uh, became easier, it's something that uh, as a recruiter, I was always dreaming about to unlock the location, to be able to hire a person from everywhere. This actually uh, helps to change the team, change the direction, and actually change the product as well. And uh, Miro, of course, is the company that is, is a product that uh, helps people to also, you know, communicate effectively, even um, 
we kind of advocate and help people to work remote and so to have this grasp of different information, different types of information in one place. So, and seeing each other moving things in this, uh, you know, whiteboard and uh, making fun of it. So that's, I think, exciting. What, what, what I also, you know, recently noticed as well that I hear a lot from the engineers on the interview saying to me, hey, I've heard about Miro doing that, or I've heard Miro is up to this. And I, I, I catch myself that uh, online companies became so important and we have to cover different channels. And this is the challenge that I see what became harder is to attract the talents uh, from different uh, resources, podcasts, from the, I don't know, video or uh, like YouTube uh, channels or Slack or, or Discord. So it became so many different uh, ways how you can do that. But it also um, made my job a little bit more creative. I have to put more efforts. So it's also what I like about it as well. And um, I, I kind of uh, became a little bit closer with my candidates as well, because when I'm talking to them, I'm calling when they're at home. You know, I see their cats, dogs, kids, uh, like delivery guys coming in. So I, what I changed uh, recently also uh, the lens of my uh, call with the uh, with people, and I always start with the icebreaker, and I always start, hey, how was this 2020 for you? Because sometimes you can hear some things that will scare you, some things that will change your, you know um way how you're going to approach this candidate because i hear a lot of complaining hey candidate has to look for a job and they're not motivated i think that this is my job actually to make person to fall in love with miro and Han, i'm gonna do that with you so <laughs> so i will i will show you why I, I, miro I'm, is a, awesome. <laughs> I'm, I'm a hard i'm a hard sell on this because um, because i'm so like incompetent I, I, I think i know what it is i need to draw it with a pen uh, anything that isn't typed i need to i need to get a physical device to draw it with and i can't type it in but anyway you mentioned two really interesting things there, Ala. Um, the first one is that we, like diversification of the contact channels um, that you need to have with um, software engineers. It is like moving into consumer type channels. You've got to be on YouTube. You've got to be on, um, you've got to be podcasting. You've got to be open using all of these different types of places, which you might not typically consider to be uh, sourcing channels. Um, but there are new places where you can interact with uh, these highly skilled in-demand people. Second thing I thought was really interesting. By the way, the reason why I break this up, folks, is so that you can make notes. Uh, so this is what you should be doing. Um, the second thing you said that was really interesting um, was that it's possible to increase the intimacy that you're getting with the engineer because everyone's doing it from their home. Um, and that's a very different experience from being in an office, they're in an office, you're in an office or in a booth somewhere, you know, where it's like, yeah, of course you're going to be so utilitarian, but like your life bleeds into your, what you're doing, you know, your cat's going to walk across your keyboard at some point, that kind of stuff. Um, and that's going to help you, you know, uh, close the gap in terms of relationship building. So that's a very interesting point for any recruiter out there. Um, there's, there's ways in which you could probably accelerate the process of intimacy, I would say. Okay, super interesting. Um, let's go to you, Katie, on this. Caddy, I do beg your pardon. I've been calling you the wrong name all this way through. Um, so, Caddy, um, what would you say that you've spotted as a difference between pre and post? Uh, not that we're af out of COVID, but you know there's a big kind of before COVID and whatever's going on after with regards to software engineering. What does that look like for you? How does it feel like for you? Yeah, so I don't want to call it a difference. I want to call it um, maybe an enhancement uh, because um, I realized there is a lot of topic going around engagement, something uh, that uh, everyone mentioned before. So for instance, take a uh, candidate experience. Um, even prior to COVID, we were aiming and I'm talking about different experiences I had with different companies. It's been a really, really big topic. We were aiming up you know, a uh, white glove kind of experience, uh, great engagement. Nowadays, after, after you know, the job market kind of started opening up uh, June, July, 
we've noticed that um, people are really sensitive and this is something you can expect during world pandemics. Um, any word here or there can be, you know, took as an offense, could be, you know, disengaging candidates. So you have to build up on really like authenticity, sensitivity, employer brand, no longer about shiny offices, no longer about perks, you know, video game machines, etc. And I'm talking about the video game sector, I mean. Um, the sooner the company started talking about how we support mental well-being, how we treated uh, employees during um, COVID, this has become, you know, a new normal to actually answer those questions. How have you dealt with the first wave? so we can expect what will happen maybe in the second or third. So coming back to engagement, what I've noticed is obviously with uh, different uh, furloughs, layoffs, you may notice an incredible amount of uh, active applicants, but this doesn't translate back to the engagement. Again, you are in a position you might be calling someone and this person you know, just really easily clicked on a role. And maybe this is not the right person for the role in the moment because they are just looking for opportunities. So you have to you have to make an extra effort to engage with that person. Now, last but not least, uh, remote onboarding and making sure how you engage post hiring. So how how do you make this person welcome uh, in uh, in the virtual setup? Uh, programs like working from home buddies, um, you know, sessions to integrate, maybe not always, you know, using cameras and Zoom calls because it gets really, really tiring. You have to be creative with that. And you have to be creative to make sure that in those first weeks and months, you get the momentum and regardless if you onboard a person next street or you know uh, in, in a country 5000 kilometers from where you're based so this is what i see you know as a challenge but as an opportunity at the same time so being closer um and you know managing a team previously in in two locations now you know back in the day people would ask me how would you run how would you manage remote teams this is a skill on, it, on its own but i feel the two teams in london and in malaga are closer nowadays that we have joint stand-ups we also share the uh different different learnings and yeah i would say that's that's the major thing that's really interesting, uh, Caddy. You mentioned three things there. I've forgotten two of them because uh, I was trying to recall the first one. And the first one I thought was really important. We're going to go back to the two, which was the like employer branding has got serious. Like the trivial, like, the trivial part, the trivial era of employer branding is over. Like you, as you say, you can't talk about the nice office as if it's of any of interest whatsoever. Um, it is about mental health. It is about what have you done, even at a society level, you know, what, what have you done with the E&I? Those types of things are going to be more, much more significant uh, than, you know, all of them. So there's a shifting of, of, of investment and focus, I think, uh, less on the uh, accoutrements or, the, or the, the embellishments of the culture, more into the, the, the root of it. Um, uh, you know, what is the culture really about? So I think that's a really important point. Go ahead, I forgot, I forgot one more thing, like really important and no one named yet, events, conferences, um, really, really big source of uh, applicants, uh, of getting your name out there. Um, it went virtual, but I would say it's no longer the same. Like we try to, we try to sponsor, you know, meetups and go to conferences that go online, but let's be let's be honest that's also a new skill and not everyone has a chance to gain it in those you know three five six months right i can no. i can add something in there which is uh so with the the landing festival some of you have been to um for us the, the organizers was hard to track uh, like what happened but it knew stuff happened because people kept coming back so that's that was the 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 main metric uh we we've done some uh events like uh you know uh, online job fairs these kind of things we can track it but it's not the same okay so we we get that tracking power now for real but it's not the same thing all right so the we definitely lost something in there uh let's say employer branding wise and then also talent acquisition wise 
You know what? On on the I think there's a gap there for right now for us to have a really uh, a, a sort of a ground up a, online event where it could be a candidate generation um, exercise. I wonder whether maybe landing um, uh, could could be the ideal type of organization to try it actually. Um, and I agree, the webinar style is not effective. We all have been on I don't know how many webinars now. I would I would be very surprised if if there's anybody watching here that hasn't seen like a hundred webinars over the past nine months. You know, we've been into like a ridiculous volume of them, right? Um, including Brain Food Live. This is a, a, effectively a webinar. Um, however, it's not the same experience as networking. And I think one of the reasons why people would attend events of this type, particularly if you're doing a, a careers fair and stuff like that, is that the engineers want to talk to each other. You know, they want to connect with other people and share that information as well as speak to employers. And how do we replicate that? Um, I think there's some bits of tooling that can help with it. I think maybe you could try Discord, which is a natural environment for developers, I would say, but also it allows for more peer-to-peer uh, type of communication more naturally than broadcast software, which is what web, sort of webinar tech is. Um, and um, there's a really cool tool called Remo um, from a bunch of people from Hong Kong. So Hong Kong represent on this. Um, but it's, I, I looked at it and I swear to God, it looked like a restaurant floor plan app. Um, you know, if you've ever worked in a restaurant, uh, I have obviously, um, Chinese person, we worked in a restaurant um, and it basically you see like a bunch of tables um and a bunch of seats around those tables um and how it works is people sit in those tables and a face pops up and a name pops there and then you can go sit next to that person um i thought of, on a few conferences that i've seen using remo i thought wow they actually have mastered the uh, the experience of networking as well as listening to talks. Uh, thank you, Allah, for sharing that. By the way, so soon, uh, virtual is happening next week. They're going to be using Remo. So if you want to have that experience and you're looking for work or whatever, if you're a recruiter that you know is interested in checking it out, definitely check out so soon V next week. Should someone share the link in the chat stream there? Okay, cool. Um, let's open it out to everyone. Um, uh, let's talk about D, E, and I. Um, uh, always a big topic in tech recruiting, folks. Um, this was the case, probably pre-COVID, we were thinking that this is going to be the primary thing, right? How do we diversify tech, right? Um, how has COVID-19 impacted this um, uh, mission, uh, if you like? Um, well, any thoughts? Can I can I go first? Probably I shouldn't, but I will. Um, and uh, I had a, a topic. It's not, it's not directly related, but it's correlated, which is international hiring. So obviously when COVID kicked in, that stopped, you know, all hiring processes or most of them uh, kind of freezed. Uh, what, I've, what we have been um, realizing is, and also this is related with the country's behavior, for instance, let's say Brazil and the United States, their behavior with the, the COVID, uh, let's call it the COVID experience was not the best, let's put it like this. And um, that that kind of created an influx of um, international talent coming to Europe, all right? So that's an opportunity right there, all right? So you're talking about diversity, let's bring in more people from South America, from North America to uh, come to Europe because this is now an opportunity. And it started recently, all right? All right. Yeah. It's kind of a boost. Sorry. T time, just, time out on this, though, because I'm, I'm actually no. quite surprised at that comment, because I, I would have imagined that with pandemic and lockdown plus push to remote, that has killed relocate, hasn't it? No. Uh, is that no, no, not true? No, 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 no. no it's just uh, it's two things. So first of all, it did in the first place, uh, but it started coming back because the talent is like, OK, if I didn't want before, now I want to relocate. And um, and uh, it brings in a couple of other questions, like, are we going to pay these people until they actually relocate? Okay, so that that's one question, um, because they can start working uh, as uh, as Katie, Cat, uh, Katie uh, mentioned, they can can onboard, you can onboard them remotely, so they can start working remotely, and then at some point they will relocate in the future. And I feel there's a stronger push for this right now. So sorry for bringing this up. I just felt like it's related. It's correlated. Was no, it? no. Actually, I want to touch on that just a little bit more because it's a really interesting phenomenon uh, that you mentioned, which is we are the, the COVID experience per country is different, and people's uh, uh, perceptions of whether they want to stay in a country mm -hmm. might actually now you know be even more sensitized. So, for instance, Brazil, especially in Portugal, for you guys, 
like always been a great source um and it's like maybe now you can go like go to town on this and, and get people to come so very interesting to hear that uh, that view lots of different things coming up but uh, okay and and i do agree related to de and i because internationalization is 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 definitely a facet there but let's talk about other parts of de and i particularly with gender diversity um because Prior to COVID-19, we were thinking, you know, how do we get more gender diversity in the tech industry generally in our businesses? You know, we're getting sick of rolling around with tech teams that are 90, 95% uh, men. How has COVID-19 impacted this negatively, positively? Thoughts on this? Everyone but Pedro. I think I can, if I, if I may, uh, add, add something to that, uh, Home. Go. Cool. Yep. Okay. Um, I'm just waiting, waiting for you to do the go. Uh, so positive and I would say a little bit uh, negative as well. Positive side was also connected to the um, to the to the conferences and meetups that, uh, that that you were talking about earlier. So yes, it's you know you have lack of networking, but the reach has become humongous, um, and this is where we saw the positive results. We participated in Women Tech Global Conference, which is usually restricted to a thousand fifteen hundred women in tech. However, with the with the virtual uh, conference this year, they could actually, you know, go go and reach out to hundred thousand women in tech from all over the world. So the sessions, the booth visits were from different countries, and since we have a group companies in different countries, we could really take advantage uh, of that. And we saw that we could we we could bring women into our pipelines, source them, and actually had some hires also from that conference. Similarly, we took advantage of you know you'd have to. Also, when you look at it financially, when you sign up with one conference a conference and invoice it, you're actually taking advantage of that globally. So we did a, uh, we attended a Women in Tech hackathon in India, which was uh, uh, global as well. Um, but we could take advantage for our Indonesia offices as well for, uh, for, for such an event. And, and the reach was really, really uh, humongous. So that was really good. It gave us the time because during this time, Hiring was on low, and only critical hires were happening. So all the, uh, you know, all the folks from all the recruiters could also participate, and we could have speakers, etc. So that was one one good aspect. However, yes, researchers have shown that, uh, especially on on the side of gender diversity, because of the, especially countries where uh, men do not share as much as uh, and 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 I'm, I'm I'm Indian, so I know it happens, you know, way back home in India. A lot of men do not share the responsibilities. So, and you don't have a kindergarten system uh, as prolific as it would be in Germany, um, and and where I'm sitting right now. So, the the the, the lady or the woman would have to handle the kids, uh, plus ensure that okay they are being you know they are on Zoom and they attend their classes. Uh, plus, she'll have to handle the household chores. Um, plus, she'll be on calls and and handling her nine to six job as well, right? So with this, they don't really have the time to prepare for your code life sessions. They don't have the time to prepare for your interviews. So it is an added hassle for them, and they would not uh, participate in, in these processes. So this becomes a bigger, bigger tug. Um, some, re some research has also showed that more women have stepped back uh, from their jobs or taken a break, um, plus not, not really applied to too many positions across. So this is this has been, and we see this a little bit in our engineering pipelines for sure. In in India, hiring it's 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 really dry. We have to really really go out and and source a lot in the in the language. Whereas, uh, if I trace back to last year, October, November, our India diversity numbers were really pushing us up on on the gender front. But this is a very different scenario we see right now from from this example. It has a cultural context definitely to it. Super interesting. Anybody else got any thoughts on this? Um, gender diversity in particular. We thought about DEI as a subset, but gender diversity in tech. What have you? What, what, what's everyone seen in this? Pedro, you can you can speak. It's fine. I've... I can go next if that's fine. Um, I've been thinking about um, an article I've read, uh, and I think Manjuri shared that um, earlier this week about senior women. Um, so women in leadership, another interesting topic, and. I've been always really passionate to build gender gender pipelines uh, and um, you know 50 50 split uh, at all levels because um, that's the role modeling we want to bring up. I think 
pandemics um also working longer because that's a fact we we all work longer it's harder to disconnect um burnout is real and oftentimes you know the share of uh what my jury mentioned of um household activities is uh is on women's shoulder and oftentimes you even end up in this sandwich model if you were let's say 40 50 plus oftentimes you don't you don't always have children, but often also parents to take care of. Uh, oftentimes you're relocated to a completely different country than you're from. Hello. Uh, and uh, that's really taking like an emotional toll on uh, women in leadership. So there is a huge, um, there is a huge appeal uh coming from women like Sheryl sandberg to protect women in leadership uh, in those circumstances also because unfortunately the emotional labor of um you know providing support to to our reports uh to taking care of their emotional well-being it often comes down to to women in leadership on another note, not only gender diversity, I think about COVID as also a class phenomenon. Um, thinking about um, you know people coming from um, unfavorable uh, backgrounds, um, having maybe less access to schooling, to better education. So that's definitely something. Thinking about future pipeline. Uh, Whereas there is a huge opportunity to provide equal educational opportunities, um, let's think about you know housing conditions when we were all confined and maybe we are again confined. Um, think about um, you know this access to networking, access to connection, up apprenticeship. How do you actually do apprenticeship or internship in times of uh, virtual work? That's a really really great question to ask. But finally, on the plus side of DNI, working from home and working, you know, not always with camera off might attract people with different cognitive um, diversity dimensions. As an extroverted introvert, I actually thrive in this <laughs> environment uh, because um, you know you can you can choose different uh, modalities and focus. So I think. This is a huge chance also for people who were not overlooked in the office environments, not very extrovert. So on that note, I think that's a positive effect. 100% on, on the, the that particularly that last point, Kari. Um, we're going to go back on all of this but, and, and go to you as well, Alan, in a second. The reason why I want to interrupt really quickly is because if you have any questions for our marvelous guests, please ask them in an ask a question function at the bottom of your screen on Crowdcast there. If you're on LinkedIn Live, you're on Facebook, you want to ask a question, just comment. Um, and I've got, I think Joe McCaddy is helping me with that. Uh, so she's going to pick that up and then uh, ping, ping it over to me. And then hopefully we'll be able to get to those towards the end of this show. Um, so, okay, Ala, let's go to you as the final thing. DE and I, particularly with regards to women in this case, or gender diversity in a better way of describing it, how have you seen it before, after? Um, what do you think? Yeah, of course, it was a hot topic for, for, for all the times and for all the companies. But to be honest, I'm looking at this from the perspective of the candidate even more than uh, as a perspective as a recruiter. Of course, as a sourcer, I can find lots of ways how I can source for these candidates using names, special communities and everything. But what I was recently thinking about, um, for example, test assignments. I was talking to the hacker rank and they are trying to create the test assignments without uh, putting any personal information about the person who completed the test. So I would like to create the ways that the company is making everything to make sure that there is no bias, there is no um, anything standing between the candidate and someone who is assessing the skills, no gender, no any other things. And so the th the, what I was thinking about, like making sure test assignments are fair for every level, for any, any person who is applying as well. And I hear a lot from the candidates, they, I don't want to be diversity token. Were your company was your company before already diversity friendly? And this is, I think, that's also a very important point for myself as well. I need to make sure that I, my company that I work with, is showing that we care. We, uh, you can trust us, and it was always important because it's not mainstream. So this is the point that I'm trying to deliver as well. 
Yeah, really interesting. I mean, the, I'm gonna have to replay this um, uh, from the, the the comments. The last uh, uh, the, uh, the three of you have mentioned some really really interesting points. Just to cover real quickly, though, on the one hand, we have a global marketplace. Uh, we push the remote. Suddenly, our our, our our reach, our absolute reach, is bigger. Um, so potentially, at the top of the funnel, um, we might be able to, uh, to 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 secure greater diversity there. Might be in, you know asterisks. Um, and then, of course, we have the uh, kind of variable impact of remote working, um, which in many cases is gendered. Um, uh, you know, it could, you, you, you say the classic example we mentioned, uh, parent, young family, young kids, etc. What is the distribution of labor when it comes down to teaching those kids? You know, is that entirely equitable at home? We don't know, um, but we can maybe guess perhaps the woman is going to take on more of that, uh, that responsibility um, than, than the man. Um, and factoring in your initial point, um, Manju, also with cu cultural context on there, right? Um, it could be that certain roles are very much perceived to be women's work uh, in some cultures. Um, and, and that would, again, you know, create a differentiated uh, impact on COVID. Um, okay, cool. Very interesting. Guys, we're moving kind of towards the end of the show now. So I want to just um, move forward to some projections, if you will. Um, uh, you know, we've kind of been doing this for six, nine months now. Um, let's just point it forward for the next 12 months or so. Um, where do you see tech recruiting going? I mean, is there going to be, uh, we're kind of going through this period now. So what is the, what is your feeling? What well, one thing that you think is going to happen um, uh, in tech recruiting that is going to be like a persistent phenomenon for us? And Pedro, count yourself in as one of the people that can answer this question. All right. So uh, first of all, it's a tough, tough question, but I will try to, to answer. Um so when I'm looking at this as 2021 and 2022, so uh, you know, let's say global wise, like what what I'm predicting is next year it's going to be a shit year, like economy wise, and the year after is where things come back to really pick up. All right, so 2022 is where things pick up. Now, all of us we're lucky that we work in a sector called tech. All right, we're very lucky people, all of us. Um, and I don't. I think that took a hit uh, in uh, April, May, but it's going to be upwards from now on. Okay. So a lot of companies realized that they need to digitalize themselves. They they were living in the the, the past uh, century, so they're coming back to to reality, to the the tech reality. So I think it's going to be good for tech. Now this doesn't mean like a huge increase. No, it means uh, um, a higher increase in in some. Uh, specific um, uh, professions within tech, like let's say uh, people working with uh, with RPA, with AI, this this sort of things. Okay, automation processes. So I think there's going to be more opportunities within tech for some uh, folks uh, rather than others. But overall, we're good. We're in a good place, and we need more people in. Okay, so that's the problem that we have right now. We need more talent in. Um, this market we need and the universities are not going to cut it. We need more people in alternative uh, uh, formats of, of training of education like boot camps and other things. We need more people in. Uh, I'm not saying uh, people that are graduates from universities are, are bad. Well, I'm one of them in computer science, but uh, we need uh, diversity. This is a form of diversity, by the way. Um, and uh, that's what I predict. So we're lucky to be in this sector. It's going up but not as before, all right? Yeah, really good point, Pedro. So what you're saying is one of the impacts of, of COVID-19 in this period is that it's a, it's a massive digitization like uh, push. Um, uh, firstly, everything goes remote. Suddenly companies are gonna realize yeah. all of your previously analog processes are really problematic. The ones that were already digitized, they're the ones that actually continue to work. Um, exactly. So there's, we're going to have a huge digitization uh, approach. That means more software, uh, probably less people, but more software, therefore more people building that software or supporting it or doing whatever. So there will be a little bump, at least a bump in terms of software recruitment, I would say. And as you say, not back to the crazy time pre-COVID, no. but definitely no, no, no. better than 2020, 2021. Okay, exactly. great. Uh, let's go to you, Manjuri. Um, give us a prediction. 12 months, um, or actually using Pedro's framework, um, uh, let's assume you know, next 12 months is also a write-off. 
Um, but with looking at 2022, 20, you know, that kind of period, uh, where do you see tech recruiting? I'll, I'll take a different angle to this. I'll talk about tech recruiting. We'll need to consider uh, capabilities, different capabilities of engineers. Today, we rather focus on the on the functional aspect. I think the what we call as soft skills may become more important. So we'll be looking at capabilities like agility, resilience to change, uh, ability to col collaborate across different countries, continents, flexibility, and also the ability to own your own um, you know, development that is you, you may not be the masters of the universe and TLC will not be in the manner of a beer fridge um, because you can't just you know, present that to people. So I think that those capabilities will definitely take uh, front stage. For tech, tech leaders, for sure, um, communication will take, uh, for, will, will take front stage as well because you'll have to un, um, onboard leaders who can handle remote teams like, uh, uh, like Katie was speaking about earlier, right? Um, so that will become really, really important and hard to predict. Though this is this is just a gauge uh, as and a and a hunch that we uh, that we are seeing uh, things trending towards. Amazing, and I, I love that. I think uh, you're entirely right. You know that what we kind of call soft skills, hard skills. You know that kind of division uh, and hierarchy. Actually, you know we've always prioritized hard skills in tech recruiting. But perhaps in the future, we need to think about collaboration. Um, you know, we need to think about uh, communication. Um, uh, you know, these skills are actually of premium uh, at any role, but particularly in, in software, which is a collaborative activity. OK, cool. Let's go to you, Caddy, on this um, prediction. 12 months down the line. What's, actually, no, 18, 24 months down the line. What's, what's it looking like tech recruiting wise? So I'm going to build up on what Pedro and Manjuri mentioned. I'm not a fortune teller on, on that one. Uh, we've already started uh, implementing different behavioral questions to actually focus on those soft skills, uh, resilience, and um, also looking how people would adapt in those uncertain um, circumstances. We see that you know there is more flexibility between you know what kind of projects may come up. So creativity becomes you know at a very very different level than it was. Uh, and again, um, I saw this article about you know behavioral interviews are dead. Let's discuss you know how would you react to uh, to what's coming up next. So this uh, resilience questions are uh, also trying to figure out how people reacted similarly as companies during COVID to, to see how the soft skills resonate um, in the future. And I believe, um, you know, the acceleration when it comes to the usage of technologies, automation, AI, that's not gonna. That's gonna just uh, continue uh, even uh, even faster. Uh, so uh, potentially we will see something. Not even boot camps for really fresh people, but for people who are used to certain technology but have to build up very very quickly. And you see uh, that that um, you have to actually uh, update your skills really on a daily basis. So that's a challenge for a lot of technical talent as well these days. That that's a really uh, good point, Caddy. Is, like your ability to acquire new skills is also going to be a premium for all people, really. I'll, I'm going to come to you uh, in a second because I've just realised I ask people to ask questions, and there's two questions, and I haven't actually asked them, so I need to go ahead and do that. Um, uh, this is to everyone, by the way. Uh, first one. This is from Daniela McDonald. She's saying, um, when you talk to candidates, are they looking for different things from companies and jobs now, or, or jo uh, are they looking for different things from companies or the jobs now? Um, has anything become more important than before? Okay, so have candidate priorities changed? Um, uh, only one person can answer this, so whoever wants to grab it, go grab it. Who, 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 who's up for answering this? I can. <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> because I feel I've been talking a lot. Um, again, um, the top number one, question from the candidates is how did you support how have you supported your employees how will you support if you know future is unpredictable so uh, the expectations on mental and well-being and being able to provide this nice flexibility of work-life balance to me that's that's a theme and you cannot also come up with answers that are not authentic 
Um, yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. I think the the realization of companies need to be more than just profit maximization. Uh, that that for developers and technical people, I think is very very strong. Okay, thank you, Caddy, for that. Um, one more. This is from Kenneth K from LinkedIn. Um, thank you, Joe, for putting this over to me. Um, essentially, the, the assertion is companies are moving away from visa sponsorship. Um, doesn't that create a massive bottleneck with regards to diversity and inclusion efforts? Um, anybody want to take this? The first assertion, I'm not sure it's true, but let's talk about that. Well, Our company well, moving away from visa. Thinking about that, not sure if it's true. Like what's happening is uh, the bottleneck, like for the, those relocations, is the situation itself, like uh, airlines, visa, like even the, the local entities to issue the visas, all of that. That's the bottleneck is there, like in the, in the governments, in the, the institu institutes and the airlines. Um, because the will, like people moving out, like... <laughs> There's a lot of Americans moving to 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 uh, Portugal right now. Um, this is true, Pedro. But what he's what Kenneth is saying is that companies are are now not thinking sort of about sponsoring visa. Is that? I mean, what do you think? Are you, I, all I of you actually. The question is like uh, it, it it makes a kind of sense. But the thing is, like, what's happening? We're talking about tech, okay? What's happening is people are working remotely until they are allowed to allocate. The, the thing is that time, that timeline is going to be longer than people think. That's it. That's the only yeah. thing. So what companies need to do is sort out payments. Are these people going to be contractors, invoice them? Are you going to use some sort of tool to do that? Are you going to manage that? So that's the, the, the only thing I have to say. Yeah. Anybody else want to respond to that? Are companies more reluctant to sponsor Visa or not? Actually, actually not, and and I align with uh, Pedro and, and and Katie on that. Actually, not. It's it's a bureaucracy that is uh, stopping companies right now because, again, you you cannot fly the family over. You cannot if the embassy is slow. You cannot get the work permit. And from certain countries, unless you're freelancing, then you can't be on rolls because of tax purposes and uh, so on and so forth between EU non EU candidates. So that's the challenge that companies themselves are facing right now. Got it. Okay, Kenneth, I hope that answers the question. Um, Ala, we're going to go to you with a final word on the show. Give us a prediction. Um, 2022, what does tech recruiting look like um, for you? Thank you. So I was actually hoping that it will start recruiting on Mars, but I think it's too early. So then um, as we stuck a little bit here, so I would say that uh, what Miro Wedge is doing uh, is adding extra skills to everyone in the company. Uh, all recruiters right now having uh, sourcing trainings with me and I'm um, helping them to, to love and to, to try sourcing from the different perspectives. But also what I think we are going to be better at, at planning. So we will plan... Um, who we're going to hire, how we will be having very good focuses. Um, we will really go through the process. And what is also, I think, I'm quite positive person. I think that we will focus on the learn term strategies. We will start building communities. We will encourage people to join them. Uh, and so this, I think, community driven uh, recruitment, this I see the future. So, yeah, amazing. And I agree with you. Community based <laughs> recruitment, that's actually going to be critical. Because I would say an incumbent worker right now uh, whose tech is going to be hard to shift because they're very risk averse, uh, but they're happy to have a conversation with you. Um, and I think a lot of tech recruiters right now might be very frustrated that they're having these great conversations, but they're not converting the candidate yeah. because the candidate is like, hey, of course, I'm not going to move right now. Are you crazy? Um, however, what they need to do is think long term. And I think the way to do that is via community rather than through a pipeline. But more on that later, more on that on another show because we are out of time. Uh, so thank you, everyone, for watching Brain Food Live on our episode. 81 has been an awesome show. I think we could continue to talk to these these amazing guests for a long time. So firstly, let me thank them. Manjuri Sina, thank you for joining the show. Amazing to see you. Um, uh, great to see you as well, Ala. Uh, we'll talk about Miro at some other point. I'm gonna. I'm now inspired to in investigate this. I'm ashamed, actually, <laughs> of my incompetence. So I'll dive into it. Um, and Carrie, thanks for jumping in last minute. I know you got loads of things happening in your private life. Uh, good stuff, I understand. Uh, but we'll talk about that a bit later. But um, um, but yeah, great to see you here as well. Okay, that's about it, everyone. If you've enjoyed the show, make sure you follow the channel. We do this every week, folks. Every Friday, we do a show like this. Um, next week, we're going to be talking about recruiting KPIs. Same concept. Has that changed before or after COVID-19? Time to hire. Is it still 30 days? Is it 50 days? Is it five days? What? 
We've got Andrea Marston from VMware going to join us. We've also got Marissa Bryan from Secede. It's going to be amazing. So follow the show. You'll get an update on that uh, on that uh, event when it's uh, happening. Okay, final, final point. Thank you to our sponsors again, Past Technologies. If you are hiring anybody remote, on-site or otherwise, you need to background check them. Uh, use Past Technologies to do that much faster and better than chasing by email. Okay, that's about it, everybody. Go and enjoy your lunch and enjoy the rest of your day. Um, we'll see you next week. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. bye. Uh, no, everybody stays. Huh? I'm staying. There's always. <laughs> I tell you what, we're gonna do, Pedro. There's like a, a like a game. No, no, no. It's, this is like the behind the scenes, right? Because everyone All disappears, right. which I like. Not that mm -hmm. I don't like, but it's like everyone's left the party. But then yeah. we've got to clean up the party, right? um and it's always cool to just have a chat so um anyway it's good to see you tell us about future works man i mean you mentioned at the beginning it was like a little bit of a are you still exploring the value yeah, we, we're still so like we this is probably the second biggest innovation in in two years so last year we we went like uh full speed to contractors so we we now have people working like uh, uh as contractors that's cool because especially in a country like portugal it wasn't really a thing you know like uh it's more of like outsourcing this sort of thing so that was cool so that's what we did last year and then we started uh, uh future works as a brand so it's going to be the the organization's uh, uh mother brand if you want it like that on landing jobs is everything about recruitment we're going to have the event as part of future work so it's going to be a community you when he said community-based recruitment i was like bullseye that's it you know community uh events like tech with with tech with you know a place where people can go and learn and and interact with each other with their peers online offline both doesn't matter uh, hybrid events actually i went to one as a speaker it kind of sucked by the way tell um, me about hybrid events this is you showing up and no so one I went, <laughs> so i went to one event it, it was it was a agile uh, uh conference uh, uh so it's more tech uh thing and then i went there uh, as a speaker there were like what 10 other speakers there so everything according to the rules is fine um and um I was part of this panel, and, and the, the thing is, there was there was like a, a Avery's booth there with the, with the, with someone like, but it, the the whole thing was weird because there were like what thirty people tops, but then watching live there were like two thousand, and what the organizers told me was like it was chaotic to organize it because you had to cater to both experiences. Exactly the same analogy we're saying with the Macintosh and the Windows uh, laptops. You have to do both at the same time and it's crazy with the same amount of resources so it's just crazy so that that's one thing and then we're going back to the future works conversation we're doing um what we're doing is we're testing new career products so there's one that is going really well which is a talent agent so maybe we can talk about this uh, later but this is what a talent pays uh, a recruiter to help them find a job you know right so like a it's, sports it's agent not, type of person sports arts it's the same thing but you know the the agent doesn't get paid as much as uh, uh the george mendes uh, guy right 30 million or something like that. 30, but that guy is, is crazy i don't understand but okay so uh so we're doing that so that's going really well and that's what i'm saying i'm getting a lot of uh, relocation people so people like from brazil nigeria india that purchase this product then they get like specialized five session um, um, job search uh, uh, with the job uh, uh, talent agent kind of thing. So the key is in the pricing. The way we did it is they pay one of the euros up front, so kind of a retainer, and then they pay the rest, which is extra 300 euros when they land the job. I see, I see, that's good. And people go like, oh, that's the pricing? Okay, I'm in especially for introverts for you know and it's already working we had uh, 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 an italian girl that was in porto she relocated to the uk yep and she did like a what a coding boot camp online she mm -hmm. wrote something like that mm -hmm. I, mean, I gotta be honest that's not the the the, um, the thing that companies are are like looking for you know Dude, and this is actually really interesting, man. Because it's cool and, and it's deep. You know, we're really helping these people. So I'm really excited about this specific product, but there's more things we're testing, like learning and, and coaching as well. 
yeah, yeah. It's this thing it could be a it could be a a product on its own a brand on its own because yeah. the only guys i see doing something about the like this is placement dot dot com or dot io uh they are a san francisco uh company but it's different it's only it's like the high end you know it's the when i'm i'm targeting like everyone like not the low end but the 99 percent. let's put it like this you know what that's a really there's two interesting topics there community i think i'd love to do a brain food lab on that actually that would be an awesome one yeah we'll bring you in for that um and uh, and yeah the talent agency angle this is something that people have really talked about for a long time and no one's figured it out um and i think the main problem is typically the exclusivity idea like the candidate is not going to pay because you know they'll generate a job elsewhere you have to track the, how that works so what are you gonna do chase them up not gonna happen but if they're relocating they may be super dependent on you as being their eyes and ears on the ground so you've actually the conduit to opportunity more um and that's where you know you could genuinely um uh, add the value and as you say price point is i would say reasonable um reasonable. even more than reasonable um particularly when you've uh, uh, backloaded it um uh, which means yeah. that you know this is post this person getting the job so super interesting man okay listen oh, yeah. um a final question for you How, what do you think of the show is that okay you, 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 you thought i think it was cool i think it was uh i mean there was no fighting or anything but uh like for me it was like when it, when the the diversity uh question came i'm like i'm out guys like um okay i can say like i'm a latino white so you know i get some extra points there but i'm white so it's a uh, white male in tech i mean like I, I can, you can totally talk about thing, it. Um, the only thing like i i can say is like i i feel that like uh, because i'm part of the cto's portugal community and um if you if you think there's not enough women in the in, in tech like developers then talk about leadership roles that's like it's yeah. there there's no one there's almost no one so uh, yeah yeah it, it was a concern that we had so that we are three co-organizers me and an, another guy from porto and we brought in a girl uh italian girl that moved to portugal because we had this concern like we want the the the, um, the heads of this group and trying to influence some things in portugal as well to to think about this because sometimes we we care the guys we care but we don't get it so we yeah. always need a, a, a female to even if it's just to say hey don't forget about this angle you know um you know what it's just for that it's dude that's a really good distinction i want to just pull out because you can get it at a rational level but you don't like viscerally get it uh, because you haven't got the lived experience you'll never really get it like 100 yeah. uh, you can be an ally you can be a great ally uh, just an ally or something like that but you will never get it yeah it, absolutely anyway listen that's uh, we're still broadcasting by the way i should have told you that um oh, i didn't <laughs> say like, anything i wouldn't say publicly that's it. it's like behind the scenes man you know it's, off, it. it's, it's free content i don't know anyway oh, this, this is the best part right yeah. <laughs> this is where we should crack open a beer like we should create like a uh like a beer moment like we have a beer moment or we have some chill out moment and say what we really think all right anyway listen man you have a very good weekend great chatting with you great to see what you guys are doing you by the way i don't know what diogo's mentioned to you but we're probably going to do some stuff um with landing which is be something but i mean uh operationally like uh oh, yeah. this guy is all over it uh follow up with diogo is the yeah man. yeah absolutely i just want to let you know it i'm excited yeah. that, uh what we've got cooking in there so it should be cool awesome. you have a good weekend i'll catch up with you whenever hopefully we'll catch up soon let me know what uh right. is new okay all right cheers man bye and there's still 23 people watching this broadcast. Folks, you need to go and get some lunch. I will see you next week.